Hi, this is Chip Zion, and this is my life in the theater. Ah, okay, well, here we, here we go. Ride the Winds. I know many of you saw it. It was a heck of a show. Uh, I played a 14th century samurai swordsman slash Buddhist monk. And uh, I was really concerned when I had the samurai sword that I would look strong because I was also shirtless from the, from the waist up. The choreographer was the pers first person to disappear on this production. <laughs> The director was Lee Sankiewicz, who, who did uh, uh, Cuckoo's Nest off-Broadway. It was a big hit and became the movie Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, he had hired me to play this role in Nari. I was in Nari. And at the table read, Danny DeVito, one of our great stars, was playing a character who was mute and, and deaf. We did the whole thing and he sat there looking at the script and after the thing was over, he, he took a script and he went, closed the script and gave it back to the director. And he said, thank you very much. <laughs> and that was the last we saw of Danny DeVito. And Taxi was almost, it was just a few moments later for, for, for Danny at, when he became a big star. John Simon reviewed Ride the Winds. Uh, for you young people, John Simon was one of our more uh, difficult critics. And he wrote that the dog that barked on cue in the second act was the best thing in the show. Should we move on? The next show, uh, Oliver Town was at the Booth Theater, and uh, I think of it as really being my Broadway debut, but first of all, I, I, the Booth Theater is fantastic. Uh, it's one of the smaller Broadway theaters, and it's just this beautiful theater. I had been in there one time before, before I went in to audition for Oliver Town, because I went to an open call for your good man, Charlie Brown, that was gonna go out of town. And I had never been in a Broadway theater at that point. And uh, so I walked in the stage door of the Booth Theater and I thought like, this is fantastic. I actually get to see what it's like uh, backstage at, at a Broadway theater. Somewhere along the line, I'd been doing a non, no, an equity show uh, at the a place called the Equity Library Theater on the guest list, uh, you know, the, the notables who were coming to the shows, they would keep a list for us. And one of the notable people who was coming to the show, his name was on the list, was Dustin Hoffman. So I, it actually made me physically ill. Uh, the show that we were doing at the Equity Library Theater was How to Succeed in Business. But it, anyway, Dustin Hoffman's name is on, the, is on the guest list and everybody's going, oh my God, Dustin Hoffman is here. And to me, he was at that time, in my mind, the, you know, the biggest star ever. And I, I couldn't believe I was gonna uh, perform for Dustin. A couple years later, I was in Boston doing Moonshoulder, and Dustin Hoffman called me on the phone. He said, you know, we'd like you to understudy in uh, all over town. I, well, it, it, there was a little thing that happened first, which was that I ran into Dustin Hoffman, who asked me what I did for a living at, 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 at that pet store that's across from Bloomingdale's. You guys have ever, it's still there, American Kennels, I think. Dustin Hoffman, uh, my wife was in the New York, this is, I'm, 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 I'm diverting, I'm gonna get there. The, my wife was in the New York City Ballet with, with uh, Dustin Hoffman's wife at that time. And so she had stopped to talk, my wife had stopped to talk to, to Ann Hoffman. And the next thing I knew, Dustin Hoffman had his arm around me. And I, I, I just, I, you know, I thought, I, what does AFib feel like? You know, I, uh, that's how I felt. And, and he asked me, like, what do I do? Come on over to our, our brownstone and uh, have a drink. So I'm now walking up Lexington Avenue with Dustin Hoffman, who keeps saying, so what, what, do you, what do you do? What do you do? And I said, I, was, I said, I work at night. I was coming up with strange comments. And finally I said, well, I, this is embarrassing, but I think you saw me last night in a, in a show called How to Succeed in Business at the Equity Library Theater. And he said, no, 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 that wasn't me. Uh, that was my business partner. We're just looking for actors that we like because we've got a few projects that we're thinking about. And he said, let's call, we'll call my partner and we'll see if he liked you in the show. And I said, no, no, it, it's totally fine. You don't, don't have to call anybody. We just have a little glass of wine here and everything is great. He called his partner, they liked me. The next thing I know, I'm in Boston doing um, 
Moon Children, and I get a phone call from Dustin Hoffman saying we would like you to come in and understudy in All Over Town on Broadway, which I thought was really exciting. It, 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 but he also, one of my best friends was playing the part that I would like to have been playing rather than understudy. So that was it. I ended up uh, in, in All Over Town. Uh, the show uh, starred Cleavon Little, who was fantastic in it and just a great guy. And the guy that I was covering actually one night, very early on in the show, forgot his lines and Cleavon Little ran off stage. Uh, he said to the actor, he said, stop right there, stop, don't say anything more, you're giving away the show. And he ran off stage and he went to the stage manager's uh, desk and he brought the script back on stage and he showed the actor, he said, we're, we're right here and it was the biggest laugh of the night <laughs> in the show. Another thing that pops into my head is that how just inventive Dustin was. Uh, there was a little guy in the show uh, who was a jewel thief. It was kind of a farce, the show, with lots of, like 12 doors on the second level, lots of doors. And a French jewel thief comes through the window and has to walk along the top balcony and then go downstairs these steps and then cut the cord to the telephone so that uh, uh, nobody could uh, stop him from stealing the jewels in this house. And Dustin Hoffman one night jumped up on stage and he said, I've got a great idea. I've got a great idea. Let's make him blind. And I thought this was, he, and, and so we thought, well, how do, what, what do you mean? Dustin Hoffman then jumps up, comes up to the second level of the set, comes through the window completely blind, feeling his way along the railing. One of these things that takes forever. Feeling his way all the way along the railing and then goes downstairs and has to feel for the phone because he can't see. Now he's feeling for the phone. He finds the phone, he picks up the phone, but he doesn't know how to cut the wire because he can't see it. So he's, <laughs> so he's, he, and, and you, you had a sense of Dustin's mind. I mean, he just, it was just a remarkable experience. And, and, and another thing, that, uh, there was also um, Barnard Hughes. Doug Hughes' dad was a, is a famous, iconic New York actor and just the best guy in the world. He told my dad, I, when my dad came to see the show, that, that in fact I might be able to work in the theater. <laughs> he said, don't worry about your son, he'll be okay. Barney Hughes, like, at, at one moment in the show, he did what I've always called a right angle take. Which I, which I love and I've tried to use, which is this. You, 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 you look at the audience first and then you look at the character who just fed you the line. So it's, it's that move, you know, and, and I've used it so many times. And, oh, and another thing that Dustin taught me, this is amazing. Dustin had this great thing where he said, look, what you wanna do when, when there's somebody standing over there that you're about to talk to, I, I, are my arms out of, probably out of the shot, but he said, so you, you talk to this person over here, but you keep this arm indicating, you keep pointing at this other person while you're talking to that person. And I always thought that's like amazing, how to keep the other person alive and like the whole, st you know, I thought that was just a great idea. Uh, it was really fun to watch him direct a show and, and to be a part of that, it was fantastic. I, I took all over town out on the road after we closed. We closed in Detroit, our first city. <laughs> we got to Detroit. No, we got to Chicago. Then we got to Detroit for like three days and then the tour closed. It was kind of a disaster. But Now moving on to um, the suicide. Okay. <laughs> this was a, a show about Russia, like uh, in the Trotsky, uh, Stalin, not before Stalin, or you know, early, 20th century and um, the star of it was Derek Jacobi one of the, our great actors and obviously still with us and he was just fantastic he had a line where he sat on the on the stage all the way down on the proscenium on the floor he sat down and he said you know all I want is the right to whisper and it was one of the most, in my mind, one of the most powerful moments I've ever seen in the theater. And the audience was like dead silence. He was unbelievable. He also, at the end of the show, was on an oxygen tank. He had such a big part <laughs> that he needed, to, he needed uh, a blast of oxygen to recover from what was a phenomenal performance. The director's name, by the way, was Jonas Urasis. I'm not going to say any more about that. He was Russian and barely spoke English, and all he said all the time was, more temperature, 
more temperature. And we, you're going like, what, well, what do you mean? He said, more temperature. I had a scene in the show. I played this, a, a poet with a monocle and a big beard. And I was like an intellectual and a poet. And I gave big speeches flailing my arms around. And my last really big important speech was climbing a ladder to the very top of the Proscenium Arch where Derek Jacobi was suspended in a coffin. And my ladder uh, was attached to his coffin, but the whole construction kind of swayed a little bit. It had, it, had, it had movement, and if I gestured too much, we moved a lot. And Derek Jacobi, who at this point in the show was deceased and lying on his back in the coffin 30 feet above the floor, used to whisper under his breath, Dear God, <laughs> Stop waving your arms. Don't wave. No more waving. <laughs> and that was, that was that. I also got in trouble on that show because after our first preview, we, we had a party at Sardi's where I, I, I there's an old joke uh, which I use because our producer, I, I was the MC of this party at, the, uh, at Sardi's and our producer was bald. And uh, I, I mentioned that uh, I'm seeing this event that it was so windy outside that uh, our producer's hair arrived 10 minutes before he did. And <laughs> that got me in a little bit of trouble. He wasn't that happy about that. Moving on. Um, what? This one, I've this one I don't know. Uh, into, into what? Into the woods. Um, I was, there's a huge element of luck in show business. This is my feeling about it. I had, I had worked with Bill Finn, uh, who wrote Falsettos. And through that collaboration, um, Bill, Bill brought James Lapine to work on Falsettos. So I, I, I knew, you know, Lapine and Finn. And I was really, I really considered Playwrights Horizons at that time to be sort of my home base. So I, like I did Wendy Wasserstein plays there. At some point, um, we had gone out to La Jolla to do Merrily We Roll Along, the first production after it had been done on Broadway. Uh, you know, that, I thought it was, I thought it was phenomenal. I, we were great, and I thought we were coming back into New York. That summer, during that summer, uh, uh, Lapine had invited uh, uh, my wife and I over to his country house. And when I got out of the car, he said, have you talked to your agent? And I said, about what? <laughs> he said, well, have you heard, we're not going to bring Merrily into town. Uh, I think I would say he had some personal reasons he didn't want to really do it <laughs> at that time. You know the expression, the color drains from your face. Uh, my wife said she, for the first time in her life, she understood. I turned sheet white, I mean just white as a sheet. And I, I, you know, I felt like, oh my God, I've got a grill swordfish and hang out here like all day long now. I've never been more disappointed in my life. But at some point during that day, Lapine, uh, took me upstairs uh, to his office and uh, he said, yeah, I'm working on a new show. I'm working on something new. It's called Into the Woods. And that day we had, uh, we had computers. They were sort of in their infancy in a weird way, but um, the portable computer at that time was called a K-Pro. And it, was, it weighed about 400 pounds and it was huge, <laughs> but it folded in half and it had a little four inch monitor. Lapine said, yeah, yeah, I'm working on this show. I'll show you a few pages. And he showed me pages from a show that he was writing called Into the Woods with Sondheim, which was unbelievable. And, and it had like little animals, even bugs, all running around on a day that it was snowing and all talking and saying stuff about how cold they were. So those are the first three pages of Into the Woods I ever saw. And then I got a phone call a few months later where he said, you know, um, we're gonna do a reading of the first act without music. And I would like you to, there's a part called Cinderella's Prince. That sounded perfect to me. Uh, you know, he's like a Prince Charming, some handsome, tall guy. <laughs> and he said, I'd like you to read that. And I did, I went, we did this reading. And I really thought I crushed it. I mean, I really thought that what I did was, you know, just fantastic. And Lapine came up to me and he said, what are you doing? What did you do? I said, what do you mean? I just got a lot of, I just killed, I killed it. He said, no, 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 it was like all wrong. It was terrible, no, no. I get a TV series and I'm in LA and I'm staying at Oakwood. Everybody know Oakwood, it's like furnished apartments where all these divorced guys live or kids who are trying to get TV pilots. It's just, 
there were also a lot of hot tubs there, so this was like in the early, in the 80s, this was kind of a fun time. I got a call, I, I, you know, it's like, uh, it's early, it's like seven o'clock in the morning, and my phone rings, it's Lapine. He said, listen, would you come in and read the role of the baker? Could you come back here? We're, we're, we don't know what, we haven't found a person that we, they really wanted Tom Holtz, Mozart, Amadeus. He said, we can't get Tom, so we don't know exactly who's available, but we're thinking maybe it should be you. And because I had done that earlier reading, I knew that, that that's like a great, that was a great part. I couldn't believe this was happening. So I said, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I'd love to do that. He said, well, we, we'd like to, Steve and I'd like to see you read, read some of the scenes. I said, well, let me see what I can do. I mean, I'm shooting this TV thing and I, I don't really know what my schedule is. I, so I hung up, I said, let me, I'll call you back. Ira Weitzman was a producer at Playwrights Horizons and very much involved with the casting and producing of the early versions of Into the Woods. He said, don't, don't, uh, don't fly back to New York and audition for James and Steve. He said, they're so confused. They may change their mind if they actually see you in person. He said, just say that you can't get back to New York because you're on this series and the shooting schedule would prohibit you from traveling at this time. I said, well, wait a minute. I mean, I really want that part. He said, you know, I'll stay on top of it. I'll, what, if I hear anything. And the next thing I knew, a few days later, Lapine called me and he said, uh, we can't find anybody else. <laughs> he said, so we would like you to do it. And this was like, you know, obviously one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life. And he said, so yeah, okay, it's your part. I flew back a couple days after that, a show stopped shooting and, and Into the Woods started rehearsing, so I was a little bit late. We very quickly, after three, four days of rehearsal, tried to run the first act. And after we did that, Lapine came up to me and he said, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's working. And uh, I said, okay, Let's look at it this way, James. Here's what this is. I'm on a TV series, okay? I, I don't need to be in shows anymore. <laughs> and Joanna Gleason, to her everlasting credit, grabbed me, put her hand over my mouth, <laughs> and she said, Look, I'm taking you for lunch, okay? I'm taking you for lunch. And then the rest of that, then the next day we did the same thing. Lapine couldn't have been more generous and loving about all. He said, I don't know, you know. I just I was having a thing. and. And uh, the, the rest is history. So that, that was basically, I, I sort of, in a f weird way, lied my way uh, into, into the woods, which is all about integrity and morality and responsibility. And I basically, I kind of lied my way into the show. I blame Ira Weitzman, but, but I, was a, I, I was a party to a big lie. You know, and Into the Woods was life-changing, obviously. I mean, uh, the, the earlier Bill Finn shows had also been quite, significant because it, it I developed all sorts of relationships but you know Joanne and I drove up 8th Avenue we were, we were rehearsing downtown at 890 Broadway and we would drive up 8th Avenue to go home in a cab and that giant boot was hanging over the marquee if anybody's seen that picture and our you know our names and it just was amazing you know, and I thought like, how did I, I, I know Lapine, I met Steve on Merrily We Roll Along, I, I, Joanna was a friend of mine. How does that all come about? It was just uh, miraculous in, in, in my view. And then, um, so that, you know, I, I just can never say enough about Into the Woods. And there were moments when Sondheim came in with a song called No More. Then he's down sitting at the piano and he takes out the old fashioned sheet music in those days that just, it unfolded like an accordion and flaps out on either side of the piano and he plays no more and sings it and it's written in my key we had to check keys and my key is d flat i sing best in the key of d flat and he sings this song and it's it was me and listening and paul gemignani and sondheim singing and i turn around i mean it just was i turned around gemignani who was a big bear of a guy, just tears streaming down his face. And then I kind of lost it. And you think like, Stephen Sondheim, singing, wrote this. I mean, the world is beautiful, you know? The world, it was just amazing. Later on in the show, by the way, Gemignani threw a baton at me, like a dart, 
there was a moment, I, I, I was really close friends with um, one of the guys in the orchestra, and uh, I think we had gone to Westway, the diner a lot of actors go to on night. We maybe had too much meatloaf, and, but the piano player fell asleep. He fell asleep, literally, <laughs> and took half the band with him, and then the band got confused, and so there were two, two sections of the band in different places. Paul was now calling, you know, measure 87, but I brilliantly thought I could fix the whole thing because I'm on stage and I, I, I could hear what had happened. So, so I went to a different place to grab hold of the song and get us back on. So now we had two sections of the orchestra and the actor on stage all singing and playing the wrong part of the song. And the next thing I knew, next thing I knew was a dart came flying at me. It was Paul Jemini. And after the show he said, no, no, there's only one person who can fix something like that, and it's me, Gemignani. <laughs> Do not take charge, okay? No, 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 no. So, so many things. One time the fog machine in Into the Woods, we had a lot of fog when, when things got uh, foggy, and, and they broke, and they wouldn't turn off. And so we, we're all, the entire, we're on stage saying, you know, Da, 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 and it's like you literally could not see anything. You couldn't see the person sitting in front of you. And we all ended up like, and the orchestra is sputtering down there too because the fog is falling off the front of the stage into the pit. And we all ended up out on 45th Street. But it was just one of those things that you can't believe has happened, but it did happen. I could say so much, I could go on forever, but I guess we should, I should continue on to now, Grand Hotel, this is another interesting, I replaced in Grand Hotel. Now, at this point, I was also, by the way, back out at Oakwood in LA. I, I always thought I, sh I should be trying to spend more time in LA. Again, I got woken up, my agent calling me saying like, hey, they're interested in you to replace Michael Jeter, Jeter. they need you right away. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm trying to get a series out here. And then I fell back asleep and woke up again. I said, that's the biggest mistake I've ever made. <laughs> and I called my agent back, I said, whoa, uh, you know, I was asleep, I, I wasn't thinking clearly. I came back and I find myself uh, in a meeting with Tommy Toon. For some reason, I, to audition, I sang Besame Mucho for Tommy. Now, I don't know if you guys know that song, but <laughs> it's Besame, Besame Mucho. It's like, a, I don't know, it's like an old sort of jazz Latin standard. And he said, what are you doing, you know? But I had a great time, got the part, end up in Grand Hotel, and it was, and also it was at the Martin Beck at the time, and that, now the Hirschfeld, just like Into the Woods. So like, when I first went on, I had this huge put-in rehearsal, and I mean, it's, it was one of the great roles, and Jeter was just unbelievable. I mean, if you've had a chance to see it. He, he tore his calf, and he said to me that he thought he had been shot. It hurt so bad, he didn't know what had happened, and so he was out. At the put-in rehearsal, Tommy Toon, who many of you know is like the tallest man in show business, hugged me, so basically my face is at his waist. He said, uh, are you nervous? I said, are you kidding? I can't feel anything from the neck down. He said, what? No, it's just like summer stock. It's just summer stock. You just jump out there and have a good time. And he said, what's your image of the character that you're playing? And I said, well, he's an elderly Jewish man who's dying. And Tommy Toon said, no, 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 no. It's, it's uh, Judy Garland, <laughs> smiling through adversity. And I, my sense of Tommy Toon is he was one of the greatest directors I've ever spent time with because he had, he had such a visceral sense of show business, of what worked and didn't work. He could choreograph for you and make you look fantastic. And he also would say, like, if he didn't like something, he would say, "What you know what you're doing there on that line? Just do something else. There was something about him. It was such a, uh, a brilliantly conceived show. The stagecraft of it and the choreography. And, and the other thing about Grand Hotel that was so much fun was that it was one, one, no intermission. And when, you, when the show was on, you could go, um, you could, the, it takes place in a hotel and the, there's a banquette that went all the way around the lobby of the hotel. And the rule was that you could sit there and um, chat with whoever might be next to you. You could even get up and move around the hotel lobby should you feel like it, like somebody was sitting over there like, that you might want to talk to. As long as you spoke quietly 
and then remember that when your number's about to come up, just make sure you're there, you know, center stage when you're supposed to be. And you know, and I got to work with um, David Carroll, who was one of the greatest singers ever on Broadway, um, Jane Krukowski. Somehow the pressure of not rehearsing and going through the torment. Actually, I kind of enjoyed it. Okay, now, everybody still with me? All right, now, so after, I didn't want to leave Grand Hotel, really, Grand Hotel, really, because it just was so much fun, and I had a huge dressing room. We ended up at, at doing it at the Gershwin. It moved from the Martin Beck eventually, ended up at the Gershwin. And when the, I had a song at the beginning of the show where the follow spot hits you, and it was every actor's dream. It was as if the follow spot was coming from Bloomingdale's. It was this just one shaft of light coming from so far away in that giant theater. Anyway, Grand Hotel. Okay, falsettos is next. Falsettos was how I, I've, I think I mentioned before, is how I met everybody. It was really the foundation of my career. And falsettos was the culmination of, of like 10 years of spending time with all the same people, with the same people, and working on this show. And we were a family. And uh, when, when falsettos opened on Broadway, I think it's the only time that I didn't feel that normal concern we all have that the critics are descending upon you. It just didn't, it just seemed more like a celebration of our cast and our friends, our close friends. It was such a proud moment and, and, and we all loved each other and, and jumped around and laughed a lot. And uh, My first audition for, for Bill Finn was, you know, way back 10 years earlier when I did a show off Broadway called In Trousers, which was the first part of what sometimes get referred to as the Marvin trilogy. Uh, falsettos being all of them compiled into one Broadway show. Uh, Bill Finn, I, I, when I auditioned for him the first time, Bill Finn is very tall and was a very, um, uh, well, he would like me to say handsome, but he was, I would say, a little gawky and a little awkward <laughs> and very tall. I, in those days, I sang a song to audition uh, then called um, Jackie from Jacques Brel. And if someday I should become a singer with a Spanish bomb, I'll sing for women of great virtue. That was the song. And I could play it on the piano, so I played it and sang it, and Bill Finn said, at that audition, he said, stop, stop, put, no, stand up and sing happy birthday and put your hands down like that and sing happy birthday. So I started that and he said, no, no, climb on top of the piano. And I thought, oh, there's something really, really wrong here. <laughs> He's, there's something really strange about, about um, Bill Finn who became one of my dearest and longest friends. And uh, it was the strangest audition anybody's ever had. But so, so there I was with Bill, and then we, so we went from In Trousers, then we went to March of the Falsettos. I originally was Marvin uh, in In Trousers, which is sort of the central, the lead character in Falsettos. And so I, now I was playing Mendel, which I was a little unhappy about, but it's, it was fine. And Michael Rupert was always Marvin, yeah, a good friend. So we, so we do March of the Falsettos, and then Grand Hotel happens, and then we do another show for, for Bill Finn called Falsetto Land. And now, a, a couple of years after that, we end up on Broadway with Falsettos. And um, there's so many stories sitting over at West Bank, and West Bank is the bar across the street from Playwrights Horizons, which we still go to. You all should go if you have a chance, because it's great. You know, we would argue and fight. You know, I kept yelling at Bill that I need a power ballad. Where's my power ballad? He would hand me the pencil and say, well, you can write one, go ahead. It's yours, you know, go ahead. But things that we said to each other are actually in the show. Like, I, at, the, at one point in my life, I was going, I, I'm interested in politics, and Billy and I would talk on the phone, and I would say, you know, I don't get it. I don't get it. How, how'd this guy get elected? I'm doing that now. But I, I don't get it. And there's a song in falsetto. I don't get it. I don't understand. And it's, you know, it, it came out of just being friends and chatting and saying funny things to each other. You know, it was a time of, uh, of um, when we were losing so many friends, uh, falsettos, when it came to Broadway in 92. And um, a very emotional time. And um, one of the people who who came to see it one night that I'll never forget was Ray Gill, who was the original baker at that reading, that very first reading of Into the Woods. And he wasn't well. And uh, it was, we were all out in the lobby talking and hugging. and uh, It was a very emotional time and, and, uh, and I'll never, obviously never, 
forget that period, that show. Boys from Syracuse, um, this was at the roundabout, and uh, it was a year after 9-11. Uh, I ended up being twin, I was one of the Dromeos, and I was twins with uh, Lee Wilkoff, and we were pals, and uh, Nikki Silver rewrote the book. Uh, Love Nikki Silver, really funny. Scott Ellis directing, and um, it's an old show that was that George Abbott put together originally, and it was a big hit. I don't know, loved it, loved doing it. Okay. <laughs> Are we supposed to be honest when we tell these stories? The next show was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It was a complicated situation. <laughs> In our show that we're doing now, we go like this. And that means that we can say anything we want and we're safe. And nobody, nobody can be mad at us. I didn't really want to do Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> Here's the point. Robbie Sella and I played these two uh, spies in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And the truth is, it was produced by the, by the Broccoli family that owns the James Bond stuff, the Raul Dahl estate, they, they, and we have never been treated better. And when we were into the run for about six months, we all had signed re relatively short contracts because we, I think many of us were not exactly certain that that's where we wanted to be at that moment. And we had a meeting in my dressing room where we said well, the time had come to re-sign. You know, we, we all met Philip Bosco, he's great, uh, you know, uh, Mark Kudish, Jan Maxwell, Robbie. We, we met in my dressing room and we said, look, look guys, what are we thinking? Are we gonna resign or what's gonna happen here? What's everybody doing? Uh, we all said, yeah, absolutely, we're resigning. Who's had more fun than this? The broccoli, they showed up with haagen ice cream on Sundays and, and food, spreads of food and, and, and it was just, and there were 12 kids who were just charming and there were 12 dogs that we loved. One dog one night ran, took a right turn, and fell into the orchestra pit, except there was a, a net over the orchestra pit. And, but the dog's legs, he, he fell into the pit, but his legs were now caught in the net. Everybody was trying, but nobody could reach because it was too far from the stage. And underneath, the orchestra couldn't quite, any, anyway, it was one of the funniest things, one of the great, great moments in showbiz. But they rescued the dog was fine, dog was fine, but it was, it was funny. And um, oh my God, I mean so many, it was just so much fun. It was like a, it was like a circus backstage. And it just was, it was really fun to be there. And I was actually, I took a vacation and then I, come, I read in the paper, I was in, Can I was in Canada. And I read in the, in the newspaper that it was closing and I was really upset. I, I thought we would take on, um, Sound of Music was, across, was moving in across the street. I thought we would be the, the Brit, the British show that won the battle. We were gonna overtake the sound of music, but we didn't, we, we closed. There was another thing too where we entered from the audience. I entered from the audience dressed in, a, in like a 1920s bathing suit with snorkels and stuff. And Robbie, we came down these two aisles and you know, it just was, so, we got to talk to the audience like, you know, and say silly things. Do you know how to swim? Do you know how to swim? <laughs> you, and play with the kids and um, Every, and, and sometimes that show, also there was a, 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 a child catcher who flew uh, up in this, and the car flew, the car was amazing. I, you know, if you had a chance to ride in the car, I wish you all could have done it, it was really fun. It came out over the audience, it was, I, the car was amazing. But the child catcher had to fly in a net all the way out from the stage, above the stage, all the way out to the mezzanine, and sometimes past that and then come back. And backstage, it was like Cape Canaveral. There, there was like a, uh, uh, a countdown. They had to make a go or no go decision if, to make if this mechanism wasn't working. Um, oh, I don't know. Okay, so Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, a blast. We didn't really want to do it, but it was more fun than you can possibly imagine. And I wish it had run longer. Okay, Les Mis. Again, you know, I, I, uh, I replaced Gary Beach. Gary Beach, um, needed a hip replacement <laughs> and old friend, Gary's like a really good, was a dear friend and um, I got cast to go into Les Mis and this is weird. This is, I'm gonna admit to this and again, uh, you know, safe, safe space. There's a part of me always preferred the smaller sort of American shows, falsettos, uh, you know, the, the smaller boutique-y kind of musicals. So I, I kind of had it in for Les Mis and Phantom. Might have had to do with Tony Awards too, that's a whole nother, won't get into that. Um, but um, 
I've never had more fun. Les Mis, it, you know, it's really dark on stage and you have all these coats hanging over. I was Tenardier. You know, Anne Harada was my, was Mad Madame Tenardier, Madame Tenardier. I enjoyed every minute of it. I loved it. I made one terrible mistake in it, though, which I, I guess I could mention, which is that um, my first night out, I was really doing a great job. At the end, there's a scene in the sewer where, where Thenardier grabs uh, Valjean and drags him off stage. My problem was I, I wasn't actually strong enough to, to drag or carry Valjean off stage. So I did have an assistant who I would point at, and he would carry Valjean off stage. But in order, it was Alex Gemignani, by the way, was, uh, was Valjean in, in this production. So I go down in the sewer and I roll Alex Gemignani over and I scream, Javert, except it's Valjean. <laughs> I'm supposed to be yelling. It's not Javert. I named the, it was the wrong name. So, <laughs> so Alex starts to laugh. Adam, uh, you know, playing Marius is up front. E everybody now on stage is bouncing around. They're all supposed to be dead or unconscious, and they're all laughing and bouncing. And, and I'm stuck. How do I cover this? I screamed it at the top of my lungs. Javert! And now I go, because, because I really know how to handle a problem on stage. I, I said, I mean, <laughs> I mean, um, And then I just left. Val I, I think I whispered Valjean and I just walked off stage. And when I got off stage, the stage hands, the production stage manager, all were sitting on the floor. They were all, everybody said the headphones from the stage manager calling the show were on the floor. No, I've never seen an entire crew, professional crew or backstage crew, absolutely hysterical and unable to continue. It was just one of the worst mistakes ever made. So there, that, that's what, that was my opening night. I, I, by the way, I didn't want to leave the show uh, because I was really having a good time and I thought because my wife is a dancer and I know a lot of people have had hip replacements, I thought Gary Beach would not come back or be able to come back exactly when he said he was coming back. But he did and I appreciate the fact that he healed but I've always wanted, I, I, you know, I really could have used a few more months in that show. The Country Girl. <laughs> Okay. Morgan Freeman starring Francis McDormand, Peter Gallagher, uh, directed by Mike Nichols. I've never been more nervous in a, in a, uh, rehearsing a show in my life. I mean, going all the way back, <clears throat> going all the way back to summer camp. I don't think I've ever been. I, you know, I couldn't wait to work with Mike Nichols, but then I became kind of terrified of Mike Nichols. Um, but there's so many stories, but one of them, uh, I, I'll, I'll move along. One of them was that Mike Nichols decided that the set was oriented in the wrong direction. So he wanted to take the set and completely reverse it. So everything that had formerly been on stage left will now be on stage right, and everything that's on stage right will now be on stage left. He could totally reverse the set. And now nobody knows what to do, or where to exit, or what's what is what. And one of the great joys of working with this iconic director, Mike Nichols, was that he, he, had, he had a lot to say. Like, he had a thing about, like, if you get a laugh, don't lose it. He said, laughs are like, it's, it, it, it's gold. He said, and don't let anybody talk you out of it. If you can get that laugh, do it every night, it's fantastic. But he also said to me once, I said, well, you know, sometimes I, you know, I get stumped, I get stuck. And he said, Chip, it's so simple. It's so simple. You talk fast, you talk slow. You talk loud, you talk soft. You mix it all up, you've got a hell of a performance. That was Mike Nichols' advice to me. The people in the picture did not fare well. <laughs> now, you know, it was a Holocaust story, uh, in, in, a, in a remembrance. Um, and I actually found it very moving. So I don't, you know, I, we didn't, uh, critically, we, we got into trouble. When I, when we were in pre previews, um, Book of Mormon opened. And I had, I went to see Book of Mormon, which I loved, but I said, oh my God, we are so, we are in great shape. We're gonna run forever. I said, you know, our show has this beautiful message. It's really beautiful. Book of Mormon's so funny, but you know, I mean, yeah, really, we're the show, people in the picture, and I know all of you saw it. Okay, so now let's move to <laughs> The Big Knife. The Big Knife, another Clifford Odette's play. 
I got to meet Clifford Odette's son, who was a psychiatrist and uh, a really great guy. He said, you know, his, the, the writing and the Clifford Odette's, the way in which he writes is quite flowery and the language is not everyday language. It's, it's, and we were talking about that one day and, and his son said to me, it's the way he talked. You know, it's, he talked in like poetry. It's sort of amazing. Bobby Cannavale was the lead. It, it, it had a great time. I mean, it was the Richard Kind was this big movie producer. I played Cannavale's agent, and I got into just a humdinger of a fight with Richard Kind, who was really good and really funny. And my favorite thing in the show was that Richard Kind, one of his lines was he came up to me as in character, and he said, "I love that material. What, what material is that?" <laughs> That made me, I thought that was one of the great lines. <laughs> he said, I want a shirt like that. And he talked to his assistant. He said, get me a shirt like that. I love that material. And I, just, I love the way Richard kind did it. It just was, I don't know, it seemed so real to me. I did tell Rachel uh, Bro Brosnahan was, was in that show. And I told her in that show that I was a, I had been, I had invented snowboarding. And that I was one of the great, uh, that I had invented the sport essentially. And I was one of the early, um, promoters of snowboarding and, and I considered myself at the time one of the best snowboarders in the country. This was a complete, <laughs> this was just so wrong. I mean, it was just such a lie. She was wonderful. She just graduated, I think, NYU and she was just gorgeous in the show and uh, just the lovely person. But for some reason, this lie amused me and I, it just went on for months. And all of a sudden one night, Cannavale had, you know, is in his dressing room downstairs and I hear, Zion, get your butt down here. <laughs> he said, and I come down there, he said, I am in this dressing room with young Rachel Brosnahan and you have claimed that you are an Olympic snowboarder. <laughs> he said, like, how could that? Anyway, it's so much fun backstage. I wish the audiences could see everything that goes on in a show because it th was really funny. You know, I love that show. Doug Hughes uh, directed that. Um, and uh, I, I love Doug because he had this great thing when he gave you a note. You know, actors, I, I don't mind getting a note. And what I notice with actors when they get a note is that their voice gets higher. Like, no, no, I, I, I think I was gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Just no, of course, that's a good idea. I'll do it. And your voice just gets higher and higher as you get more and more defensive. But Doug Hughes had this magnificent, elegant way of saying to you, I'd just like to offer a suggestion. And I've used that a lot in my life since then. I just love that. So, uh, okay, the big knife, Clifford Odets. It should have been you. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I was skeptical. <laughs> okay. And, um, but so I felt really glad I got offered the role to play Tyne Daly's husband. And I had actually worked with Tyne and Cagney and Lacey uh, years ago, earlier, because uh, I was the assistant uh, district attorney. Uh, in several of those early Cagney and Lacey's. And I, I, was, I loved her, she, she's, you know, just a fantastic person. But I was a little skeptical that the show, you know, was the show, could the show work in, in New York? And, and it didn't last long. And, but the laughter that came in the second act was louder than anything I had ever heard before or after. You could not hear. It was like a rock concert, you know, when it's so loud, it goes, you go, you kind of can't hear, you kind of go deaf. Every night when we went to take our bows, I came through the same door that Tyne Daly did, and she would say to me, I told you this is the funniest play you've ever been in. And I just thought, you know, I love her. And, and I was working with Sierra Bogus, um, uh, who played my daughter. Sierra has played, so she's in harmony coming up. and. Um, She's played my trophy wife, she's played my daughter, she's played, <laughs> we've been in a whole bunch of shows together. And uh, I had a terrible moment where I had to take a veil, she was getting married, and I had to take a veil and lift it over her head, very fatherly and gently, and it's supposed to be beautiful. And I, but Sierra had, if she was facing upstage, she had this, she could do it, she'd make a face, which was essentially this. <laughs> and, Every night when we came, when we came to lifting the veil, and you know it's a serious moment and it's supposed to be lovely, and I lived in terror that she was going to go. <laughs> it should have been you, uh, Harry Harris, just absolutely brilliant. 
this wonderful actress is just so good. And uh, you know, again, it was well, Lisa Howard. It, again, it was one of these shows that, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, you know, it, I think it could have run in a different era. It's a, it was a really fun show to do. Um, David Hyde Pierce directed it, and it just was, uh, you know, it was kind of a blast. And, and uh, you know, I when it, when it was all over, I just I, I I was upset. I thought it was really fun. So that's that. Carolina Change, I love it. So that's, we're getting close. Uh, Carolina Change, Sharon Clark, who, who was Caroline. You know, it's life changing. She's a saint. She deserves to be, I mean, she's just, she was so good in the show and shouldering this horrible, well not horrible, enormous responsibility. She had just won the Olivier in, in, uh, in the West End for playing this role. And every performance, she was amazing, and and you just she hugs everybody, and and uh, she also taught me about how to blow on straws uh, to preserve your vocal cords. I mean, her role is so demanding, but she taught me how to, um, you know, she I bought the straws that she recommended that are like metal, and you you blow on these straws to protect your cords, and supposedly that really helps. Casey Levy, just phenomenal. John Cariani. This was just, uh, you know, I never wanted it to end. I, I just loved it. And I, I, I was only on in the second act. I came out with this big viewer thing that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I loved it. And that cast was unbelievable. Okay, so Harmony, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I started by saying, I started about, it was yesterday? When did we start? It was a couple days ago. There's so much luck in show business. That's how I feel. And, and uh, I met Warren Carlyle, the director of Harmony, through my wife, who uh, staged at Encores On Your Toes. So I become sort of socially friendly with Warren and, um, and really admired his, his work. And uh, some, I had gotten to a point in my career where I thought I, should, I shouldn't be playing any more, you know, 70-year-old Jews. Uh, <laughs> did I, was that blunt? No, I, did I, it, again, I am Jewish, so I, you know, I can say that. But my agent had sent me the script for Harmony, and he said, now I know you're get, you think maybe, I'd just done a movie called Sibchis and Sorrows, and I thought like, eh, I should maybe not, I should try to steer into some other, I can play tall people, or I could be, you know, I don't know, something else. But, um, so I got the script, read the script, and I thought, oh my God, this is like one of the greatest parts that has ever been, uh, where I've ever been invited to play, you know. And, um, and Warren wanted to talk to me, so we got on a Zoom phone call. You know, we had this wonderful, warm chat, and then, um, I communicated with Barry Manilow, who was lovely and actually knew who I was, which kind of, kind of surprised me. We did a workshop um, before the downtown production, and I had to learn like a, a lot of material. Some of the other people had done readings of it, so they were kind of familiar with the show. But I was com not familiar, and I had to learn these songs, and I, I just, it was terrifying. It was 10 days of terror, and trying to learn a huge amount of material, and. And Warren, God bless him, he said, just, sip, just sing what you sing. There's a song I do at, uh, late in the show called Threnody, a term that I didn't know. It means, means it's another word for lament, really, like some, uh, a final lament. And uh, it just goes 100 miles an hour and it has a million different things in it. And I barely knew it and I sang it and I just thought, okay, I'm out. <laughs> I'm, they're never going to have me back here again. And, but they were so sweet about it and applauded and, you know. Um, I love our show. I'm really proud of it. I, 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 um, I think it's a great story. It's a big story in a way. The guys playing the six guys playing the harmonists are, at their age, I could never do it. You know, they can all dance. I mean, they're funny. They sing. They sing in tight six-part harmony. And they're, they're really amazing. You know, Sierra, it's really good to be on stage with Sierra, who I love. And, Julie Banco signed on, and she's, she's really special. We laugh a lot. It's just been, um, you know, it's a labor of love. I don't know how many more of these I would be doing and have been offered this part at my age, at this stage of my life. I just, 
I view it as an enormous gift and I feel very lucky to be in it. You know, when I look at this, 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 I think like, what was I doing? What, what was I thinking? How did this happen? I, I just literally, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer. There actually are people, a lot of people in the business who think I should have been, but, but, but like, come on. Like, look what happened, you know? Uh, I, I, I went to a camp in northern Wisconsin where I played uh, Eliza Doolittle, I played Lola and Damn Yankees, I played Annie and Annie Get Your Gun. This is where it's, you know, it's re until my mom called the camp and she said, you know, um, really, is there anything else he could play? You know, um, it was, you know, it was the 50s and early 60s, so that people were. You know, I like to say I set the gold standard in show business, but the, but the truth is when I was a very young man and I was playing Eliza Doolittle, I was probably 11, uh, I got very upset with the director, who was, by the way, is coming to the show in a couple weeks, but I got very upset with the director because I was some argument about something he said, it was a note, I didn't think he, I didn't think he was right, and I got angry, and I stormed out of the theater at camp, and I jumped in a canoe, and I paddled to Teepee Island, which was an island in this lake, <laughs> and I was screaming. You know how when you're at a lake, your voice echoes like all over the place? I was screaming from the island, get somebody else to play Liza. Get someone else, okay? I'm not doing it. Find someone else. Gold standard in human behavior. I also went to a shrink once who gave me the best advice ever. She said, Chip, when push comes to shove, you just have to commit to a higher standard of personal behavior. <laughs>